Ja, ich habe das 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 Ja, ich Um, there are other there are other situations that we need to deal with. Um, there are people in the world other than Navajo. I'm sorry, there are. They're out there somewhere. <laughs> I've seen them. I've met them. I've talked to them. And they ain't today, okay? <laughs> there are other people. So you you need to learn to to, to handle other people. Other than people on the reservation. If you think you're just going to become a counselor and just deal with traditional Navajos, I, there's not that many around. You're going to have a really small clientele. If you're going, going to just deal with people here on the reservation, there's some people that are K-pop people and they're hip-hop people and they're, I know, I know, they don't act traditional at all. They wear skulls. Not real skulls, of course. <laughs> But they have, they have pictures of skulls on their, on their clothes. So you're going to have to deal with a lot of different people. And some of them aren't like you. They're not like people from Kienta. They're not like people from Tuba City. And they're not like people from Chin Li and from Say Li. Ship rock. <clears throat> they don't speak Navajo like OJ does. He's coming down the hall right now. <laughs> OJ. <laughs> Uh, uh, I tried to shake his hand a couple days ago and he wouldn't shake my hand. I don't know what that's all about. What I do? It hurt my feelings. <clears throat> okay, it didn't hurt my feelings. Um, this is a really good book. Uh, I've taught out of this, not this book, uh, but a very similar book. Uh, I trained in a book very similar to this 25 years ago. Uh, so this is a good way of counseling. This is a good, basic means of counseling. If you go into the social work program, uh, then this is the way that they counsel. It's a good generic uh, counseling technique, and, and these ladies do a really good job of it. Okay, so how do we pass the, how do we pass the class? Uh, there's 15 chapters, and there's a quiz for each chapter. Uh, you've got your textbook. Most of the, the questions come out of the textbook. Uh, so, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Uh, there's a newer version, I yeah. think. I got the, um, the old one. Yeah, that's, that, that'll work. That's the one I, that uh, I had initially. So. Oh, okay. okay. So all my lecture notes come out of that book. I'm sure there's not <clears throat> much. Does anybody have the new one? It's over here. Is that the new one? No. That's the newest copy? No, no, no. There's, a, there's another? That's the second edition, right? This is the third. Third? third? And is that the second? Yeah, second. I had the first. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so the fourth edition? There's a fourth edition? I don't know. Is there a fourth edition? Ask my husband. I don't know. He Does he know everything? Yeah. It's it's on tape, so. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. If this is what was on the book school. Okay. Yeah, that's good enough. I I get to order my book. I was do it today. Yeah. Just whatever the latest edition is? Sure. Or you can go on Amazon and buy a $2 copy of that. This one was only like $15. I got it from somebody else. If you get the newest one that's on the bookstore, it's like 100 and something. Jeez. Oh, For how many pages? Oh, I don't know. I know. Yeah, on the bookstore online, it's like $100. Yeah. So I sent all of the original textbooks from the bookstore back. I saved $200. To the I would find it cheaper. It cost $50. Okay. Yeah, get this one. I'm a real cheap bastard. That's, okay. That's actually okay. Okay, uh, so there's 15 quizzes, or 15 chapters, and a quiz for each chapter. Uh, the, all the answers are in the book. Uh, they're all on the PowerPoints. That's where the uh, quizzes came from. Five page paper, and the five page paper has to do with the problem of your character. Um, if somebody is brave enough, uh, you might, uh, once upon a time, two, two years ago when I taught this class, uh, we had an individual who was, whose character was transgender. That was fascinating. Uh, last, last time we had an individual who had been sexually molested. That was her character. Uh, and that was interesting because these are some of the things that we need to deal with. That's some of the things that you're going to deal with in the past, in the, in the future, I'm sorry. 
So if anybody uh, would like their character, that that's always good. And depression, you know, alcoholism, you know, that's something that uh, we see practically every semester. So something odd uh, that that will be that will be fun. Okay, and, and it will be good for for everybody to uh, to deal with that 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 of course. If, but of course, if you've had a problem, then you cannot that cannot be your character's problem. Otherwise, we'll be dealing with your, with your problem, and that means you're going to have to go to counseling. And that's what happened to this guy. Um, he got into, he got into a, an introduction to counseling class, uh, and it brought up all of these things that had happened to him in his past. Also, is that why you don't want us to do Because it'll trick my trigger? Yeah, it'll trigger uh, problems that you've had in your past, that you, if you haven't dealt with it. Uh, or if, even if you have dealt with it, they may come back. Uh, because of course you're going to have to be you're going to have to act this out on a, on a relatively continual basis Yes, so no, please do not select something uh, a problem that you had in the past <clears throat> uh, There's a discussion question with each uh, chapter and That's worth 150 points. Uh, you have a fictional biography that you're going to have to come up with uh, the you know Whatever whoever your character is you have to make up a name too. by the way. You can't have your own name <laughs> your alter ego. Okay. Uh, if you're female and you want a male uh, character, that's okay. If you're a male and you want a female character, that's okay too. Um, will this be on Blackboard or not? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I will send you a copy of the biography. I was going to print it out, but then I realized, well, most people would rather type it out. When is the biography due? I'm sorry? When is the biography due? I don't remember. What did I say? Sometime in September. I don't know, 23rd of September? No, it's the paper. Your paper is good on the 23rd. Uh, you need to finish your paper so that you know how to act, okay? Because you don't really have this problem. Okay. Um, get your biography in as soon as possible. Um, I've had individuals that didn't turn their biography in until the end of the semester, which is silly because <laughs> we've been counseling them, you know, the whole, the whole semester. <laughs> I have a character, he's a drunk. Can we do I don't drink, so my character is a lot of fun. But I've seen a lot of alcoholics. Oh, geez, in the emergency room? I swear. When I work in the emergency room. Okay, um, and the participation points, I probably won't, probably won't give those out. But I just want you guys to react to things. I'll ask you a question, you need to, to give me an answer. That's all, that's all the participation points are. Ten counseling sessions with ten points each. Um, you will need to do at least ten counseling sessions. Uh, but you'll do, be doing it with each other. You'll be writing up notes, uh, telling the next person what that person said, you know, what's, what's going on. Potentially, we will cure, cure you all before the end of the semester. But a lot of things you can't cure. One of them is borderline personality disorder. There's nothing we can do about borderline personality disorder. Uh, antisocial personality disorder. There's nothing we can do about that. There's no medication we can give anybody. We, can, we can't convince people that they need to stop acting that way. Uh, narcissistic personality. A lot of the personality disorders are, are untreatable. The only thing we can do is counsel them and try to talk them down from you know, their point of view. So can right? we still take on that? Um, Character, then? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. The borderline? Um, my first is... wife is borderline. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> the enemy and dissociative identity disorder. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Dissociative identity disorder. Yeah. Did you ever watch that movie? Split? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to do something. Oh, you want to? Uh, gonna I'm going to try. <laughs> Walk on the ceiling? <laughs> not, not that far. <laughs> um, I'll get some special I'm effects. looking forward to that. Okay, DID. You, you'll, you'll understand where DID comes from. Mm, Usually true. from sexual trauma. I think that, because I did a paper on this last semester yeah. already. So. Yeah, okay. All right. Sure. I don't, and it really doesn't matter. If you think you can act it out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we had one uh, two semesters ago uh, who had DID, and he was good. He should have been an actor. 
He was really, really good. And if you said a certain word, all of a sudden he turned into another character. It was fun. We had a great time. So we're going to come up with this person, and yeah. that's other people. And those ten counseling sessions are going to be, we're going to be counseling other people that character that they came up with. Right. Okay, I got it now. And then we're going to act. And you have to act it out. And the better actor you are, the the more training that you will give your your fellow students. So. I've had some really bad actors. I mean, just for <laughs> it. I was a monotone. Yeah, hi, hello, my name is George. I have a problem. <laughs> we're emotional. We're humans. We do things. Okay. So, there you go. You need to create a character. Uh, and like I said, I've got a character. He's a drunk. But he's a dynamic person. You'll like it. He's fun. <laughs> It, so if, uh, I don't know, I don't know if there's an even number of people in here, uh, as long as we, if we have an odd number of people, then we, we will take on my character, or my character will be out to counsel, my character. Okay, there's a little, he punched me the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting in front of him, that wasn't my mistake. <laughs> and he was talking, and he, he kept talking about the faculty, so kept punching me. <laughs> He's, he's, a so, he's, he's a lot of fun. I have a question. Are these sure. um, counseling events going to happen in class or outside of class? In class. class. In class. Okay. Is everybody going to watch one specific person? No, 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 no. Everybody's going to be counseling somebody else. Mm -hmm. So for half the time, you will be the counselor, and for half the time, you'll be your character. Mm -hmm. Okay? Hmm. If you're uncomfortable with this, uh, then maybe you're in the wrong field. Sorry. I mean, you're going to have to do this eventually with real people. So let's practice. Let's see how things go. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I think I'm in the wrong field. <laughs> I'm impatient. I don't like to listen to people's problems. That's funny because I was talking to Wilson the other day. <laughs> He asked me a question, and he, he wanted to know who, who I was and where I came from. And I started to tell him, and then he just kind of cut me off, and he started telling me the story. I was born over in Crown, over by Crown Point. <laughs> I, I was in an arrangement. He talked to me for like 20 minutes. He didn't really want to know about me. He wanted an opening so that he could tell me a story. That's what he wanted. And he did. I, I talked for like 20 seconds, and he talked for 20 minutes. <laughs> as funny as that is. Okay. Okay. Self understanding. Uh, this is something. This is something that uh, that we uh, were talking about before. That I was talking about before. You have to understand who you are. Uh, you have to recognize who you are. Uh, one of the uh, um, potentially uh, back, back in the past. Uh, all the social workers in the South were white. Well, most of their clients were black. And they didn't do a very good job of dealing with them because they didn't understand black people. They, want, they thought all black people wanted to act, they wanted to be white people. That's what they thought. So when they counseled them, they counseled, counseled them very poorly, unfortunately. And they didn't really help anybody. It was rich white ladies trying to help poor black people. And it didn't work. But you can't deal with people that aren't like you. You should be able to deal with people that aren't like you. All you have to do is respect them. All you have to do is understand who they are. <clears throat> uh, I grew up in Muncie, Indiana. Muncie, Indiana is about 20% African American and about 80% white, or it was. I don't know what it is now. I haven't been there since I was 17 years old. But uh, so I grew up with, with uh, black people. And I didn't realize they were black. I just thought they were other kids. And I'm not real bright. I'm not real smart. I didn't understand race at that time. But I figured it out uh, with the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s, in the early 60s. I figured it out. It took a while. Um, I talked to these individuals, and they talked just like I did. They acted just like I did. I didn't see any difference between them and me. I assumed we all had the same thoughts. Um, I, I, was, I was a little bit incorrect, because they didn't have the same thoughts. They had the same speech pattern that I had. 
but they didn't have the same thoughts. And so when I went to college, I went to a college with, uh, well, I told, I already told two of you this story. <laughs> I went to college, uh, the college had a lot of fraternities, and the fraternities were all segregated, which meant they were all white. Uh, so I didn't join a fraternity because I didn't think that was right. I, I, went to, I lived in the dorm. And I lived in the dorm with, uh, with African Americans. None of the fraternity people lived with African Americans because they were in segregated fraternities. But I, I lived with all those African American individuals who I'd grown up with. That's just the way it worked. And when I joined the military, of course, there were African Americans in the military. Um, but I was used to being around people that were different from me. As I, as I grew up in a, uh, well, I think I've told you, some of you this story before. I grew up in a Methodist town. Uh, we weren't Methodist. So we were, we were rejected right off the bat. <clears throat> not only were we not Methodist, we weren't anything at all. We weren't, we weren't religious. So I don't know. Most religious people can tolerate other religious people, but they can't tolerate non-religious people. They have a real hard time dealing with people that have no faith. And so that's, that was the situation we were in. We were living in a community where everybody had to be religious, and if you weren't religious, you were rejected. So that's the, that's the way I grew up, and rejected in a, in a religious society. And it was really kind of interesting. I still have... So there's another one of my problems. I don't deal with religious people very well. <clears throat> so I've studied religions because I'm so interested in why these people are so, so, <laughs> so hooked on this, this one idea. We need to understand our clients' personal beliefs. We need to think about their beliefs. We need to recognize that they have, may have beliefs that are, are different from, from ours. This was the problem that the uh, uh, white social workers had with the African Americans. They didn't understand their thought process, that their thought process was different. They thought that they wanted to be white. And of course, why would somebody want to be something that they're not? And that they can never be, unless you're passing. Have you ever heard that term before, passing? <clears throat> it means trying to be somebody else. Or you, you look close enough to that group of individuals that you can pass. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This will be influenced by different aspects of the client, the client's culture, of course. We need to recognize that they may have a different culture. Uh, is, are there different cultures on this reservation? Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this before. <laughs> different clients have different personalities. We've already, we've already discussed this one. Okay. Different clients have different personalities. People from the West aren't quite like the people from the East. People from the North aren't quite like people from the South. People who have lived uh, near Farmington, the people that live over in Shiprock are different from the people that live on the other side of the mountain here in Saley. Because people in Saley don't come in contact that much with people that aren't, that aren't Navajo. <clears throat> but people over there, they come in contact with, with white people all the time because Farmington's right there. And Hispanics. And that's something that, is that true? Or did I just make that up? I can make stuff up. <laughs> I'm really bad. <laughs> <laughs> step up. Is that true? Okay. All right. Uh, so the culture is, is very important. How closely do they adhere to the culture in which they grew up? So if you grew up on the reservation, do are all the people on the reservation, do they all act the same? Mm -hmm. Of course they don't. We've got those people that are wearing the skull things, and I, that seems like that would be against the rules. There's, there's a taboo against it, right? You're not supposed to touch anything dead, so why in the world would you have a giant skull on your shirt? They're just their own people. Like, I, they are their own people. That's the whole point. Yeah. It's the, like, they're their own people. Culturally, it's, um, it's, it's a way to stay hidden. Because I found out um, a medicine name that black and skulls, it usually tends to mean that, you know, that person wants to stay hidden, doesn't want to be seen. How many hidden people do we have? One, two, three, four. <laughs> I wore blue today. Yeah, I wore blue. <laughs> I was in the last class. I, I wore blue on purpose. I took my black shirt off, put blue on today. <laughs> did you have a black shirt on? Yeah, I did. did. <laughs> uh, okay, so why do you, and you wear black to hide. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it's important that you hide, I guess. 
I hate driving in Chinle at night because everybody has black on. <laughs> drives me crazy. And the street lights are just <laughs> what street lights? Yeah, what street lights? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the client's race is important. Uh, how strongly do they identify with their racial structure? If there is a more, is, if there is more than one race represented, which is the most important? Uh, some people have, are not only native, but they are also African American, or they're Hispanic, or they are. Oh God, he's locking us in. <laughs> or some black people have white ancestors. They have a white parent. Uh, Halle Berry's mother is Italian. Um, Right. I don't know what. Jason Momoa is half white. He is half white. Yeah, he's not from Iowa. So proud. He's from Iowa. Yeah. Hey, I'm from Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> we must look alike. <laughs> Jason Momoa and I. Okay. He's Samoan though, isn't he? Yeah, he does have it. Do you think he identifies more with being from Iowa? Yeah. No. <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> if there's more than one race represented, which is the most important? If there's more than one that uh, it, <laughs> is the multiracial aspect a factor? In other words, if you're more than one race, do you, are you split between the two? Do you identify with both cultures? Isn't that like a way that you can counsel someone if they're not if they're more than one race? You have to figure out first which one they most identify with, and then you can finally figure out how you can, like... But that's part of it. Right? Yeah. So. But we have to identify their problem. Maybe that doesn't have anything to do with what the problem is. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to deal with a problem that's not there. Which we don't want to create be. a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is one Just because they're multiracial doesn't mean that that's a problem that they have. But it might be. And it, may, it might be a factor in, in what's going on with that select yeah, individual. Be. Because like there's a lot of old people around here that doesn't like. Well, I'm on Tanif, and I heard a grandma. She was complaining about her kids being or her grandkids being half, half. I think half Mexican. Okay. And then a couple of them were half Polynesian. Okay. And she was like saying, I don't know how to deal with it. I don't. I don't. You know, she was like literally talking down on it. So I think there is a problem with you know some people being half racial, especially if it's their grandma or whoever talking down on them. If they're so it all depends on how much they interact with their grandmother who doesn't. Well, not like just them. grandmothers, like just people in general, because I had problems with it. I grew up in Salt Lake, and my teachers didn't like me because I was Navajo. So. That yeah, and that's it. It really all depends. Yeah. It depends on where you, it, it depends on your environment and it depends on what's going on. Yeah. So it does not necessarily just how you identify yourself, but like how other people identify you to your, your sure. environment is what we're yeah. interested in. Yeah. If you recognize that, if if you if that bothers you, acknowledge it, you, if you acknowledge it. Exactly. Exactly. If it has been a factor in your life. Like in my life where I was not Methodist, so or or any religion, so people they yeah. like to pretend that I didn't exist. I was like you, I didn't know the whole racial thing. I didn't know it until I moved here again, and that's when I figured it out. I was ah. like, oh, okay. Oh, so that's what's yeah. going on. Okay, now I understand. Okay. Yeah. It, I mean, these kinds of things happen. So, is that a factor? Well, I've been able to deal with it all my life. Um, I think it just depends on how serious the problem is. But you know who got to walk point? <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't the good Methodists that got the walk, walk point. It wasn't the Catholic. <clears throat> I had a sergeant. I had a uh, uh, first sergeant that told me that uh, I have no atheists in my in my uh, my unit. It says right here on my my dog tag, no religious preference. That pissed him off. So guess who got the walk point? Guess who was the guy that. Uh, I, I think there might be enemy up there. Let's assume <laughs> right. He's not going to hell. Let's come out. <laughs> if there's a hell, he's going to it. Oh, look, there's a hole. Let's, let's let Bradway crawl into it and see if it's a booby trap. Oh, you think I'm kidding. This happened to my brother, too. Anyway, all important stuff. All, all real important stuff. So, these, are, these can be factors. Or they can't be factors. Maybe they're not. Maybe things every, maybe th everything's okay. Uh, in the the family that is 
multiracial, maybe they don't care. And they don't identify, they don't interact with that grandmother because she rejects them to some extent or she treats them differently. Well, she was that, well, from what I heard is that, you know, she's the only one taking care of the kids. Uh, that, that's, yeah. <laughs> that changes everything completely. Okay. My grandson, uh, my grandson, of course, is my grandson, but uh, his uh, father is lives down in Florida and they're rich people from Florida. Uh, and they act differently than we do. Uh, Hoosiers from, well, from Iowa. People from Iowa. You know, Jason, Jason and I. <laughs> the way that we act and look, of course. <laughs> We're kind of like twins. Yeah. You see it? I grew my hair long. All right. Can I ask you? It got tattooed a lot. Can I ask you kind of a personal question sure. that relates to what we're talking about a little bit? Sure. Do you have any uh, grandkids that are religious? No. No? Okay. I wonder why. <laughs> I, I was, and neither are my kids. My kids aren't religious either. But they went to church. Oh, that's, a, that's another story. Um, everybody wants to convert you. I, I've had probably more religious conversations than any, anybody in the room. Because everybody thinks, oh, this is you know, fresh meat. Well, he's, we, can, we can change him. Yeah. We're Catholic, we, we can't change the Protestants. It's not going to work. I've had lots of Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses at my door because I don't have a religion and they, they think they, they can convert me. So <clears throat> I've had lots of conversations. Uh, but uh, of course, none of them took. But I understand everything. I, understand, I, I talk to everybody. <laughs> uh, council needs to recognize that their own culture might influence the way that they see and interpret their clients. And this, of course, is a problem that, that uh, Caucasians have had coming uh, to the reservations forever. Uh, once upon a time, and this is right after the long walk, uh, they had to decide what they were going to do with American Indians. Uh, there were a lot of Indian wars going on. This is right after the Civil War. Uh, there were a lot of uh, wars going on with the Plains Indians. Uh, they had to do something with the Comanche uh, because the Comanche were controlling a huge section of right in the middle of the country. Uh, so they had to decide what they were going to do with those guys. They had to decide what they were going to do with the Apache. They had to decide what they were going to do with the Sioux because the Sioux had just kicked their butts up in, uh, up in Colorado and South Dakota. The U.S. government lost uh, a war against the Sioux uh, during the Civil War, and they needed to decide what was going to happen next. That's when Custer comes in, and that's when the uh, yes. Badlands come in, um, and they literally invaded the area uh, in order to, to induce another war so that they could defeat the Sioux. And the Sioux, of course, went up into Canada. And then they came back down. <clears throat> but uh, that's neither here nor there. But they had to decide what they were going to do. Uh, it wasn't just the Navajo that they were dealing with. They were dealing with a lot of hostile uh, tribes. The Cheyenne, the Sioux, the Nez Perce uh, tried to break away and go to Canada. Uh, they stopped them. As stupid as that sounds, why didn't they just let them go? They just let them go up into Canada. Then it makes them the Canadians' problems, right? Anyway, there's a lot of this stuff that was going on at that time. Why am I talking about this? I've lost my train of thought. Wait a minute. So, <laughs> oh, they had to decide what was, what was happening. That, what was going to happen next. Uh, there were people that wanted to exterminate all the American Indians. Uh, these are English-speaking people, and the English-speaking people have done that in Canada. They did it in Australia. Uh, they did it in South Africa. Uh, the English-speaking people tried to exterminate all the indigenous population that lived there. And so that was part of the decision that had to be made. Are you and talking about being aware of being ethnocentric? They like were they, they were ethnocentric, but they weren't aware of it. They thought everybody wanted to be Christian, everybody needed to be Christian, and everybody wanted to be white. That's what they thought. So they had to decide what they were going to do. Were they going to just exterminate everybody? There weren't that many Indians left. The reason there weren't that many Indians left wasn't because of warfare, it kind of was, but it was mostly because of diseases had killed off a lot of people, had killed off tons and tons of people, maybe 90% of the population in the, uh, in the Americans. Uh, so they had to decide what they were going to do, and they decided 
there were good Christian women that decided that they needed to Christianize the Indians and, allow, and, and try to save as many as they possibly could. So they put people on reservations and they sent missionaries out to try to take care of everything. Okay. And sometimes it took and sometimes it didn't. And I don't remember who came here. Was it the Presbyterians? They came oh, out. That's came out first. <clears throat> who did? Well, actually, the first ones, the first religious organization were Jesuits that came with the Spanish. Catholics? Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah well, we don't count those guys. Because okay. they left. And their Spanish era, there was the. the it Catholic didn't take. Ones. Obviously, it didn't no. take with this population. It did with the Pueblos, but it didn't take with you guys. Uh, after that, it was. Uh, after 1868, it was Protestant churches that came in. There was a bunch of missions like in Wood Rock, St. Michael's, that came up. And then well, St. Michael's is Catholic, isn't it? Yeah, but afterwards, like even in Rehoboth, in Gallup, New Mexico, that was originally a Catholic um, mission school, ah. and then it changed to Christian reform. So a lot of them that, that came in first uh, that were Catholic, then they switched after that. And then on the north side, uh, the Mormons came in from, from Utah and yeah. northern Arizona on that side. Trying to, trying to convert people. They were always trying to convert somebody. Initially, it was all Protestants uh, because... They didn't like Catholics. They didn't like Catholics at all. So I'm almost and Congress was all Protestant. So they tried. They sent all Protestant missionaries. But Protestants don't have to stay where they go. Catholics do. But they, they send you someplace. You can't leave. So you have to stay there. That's your mission. So you have to stay there. Um, so a lot of times, what happened? The Protestants bolted, and the Catholics moved in. But they didn't want. They didn't like Catholics anyway. They had a prejudice against Catholics. Uh, 1880 and between 1880 and 1920, 60 percent of all people that immigrated to the United States immigrated to the United States, and most of them were Catholic. They were, and they had black hair. That's why there was a heavy Catholic influence at the beginning. They weren't um, welcomed on the eastern uh, side of the United States, and so they were looking for areas to set up, and they pushed for the west. Sure. That's why actually New Mexico has a, a huge, um, had a huge Catholic and Irish. Uh, presence of right during statehood, right during that time. If you understand Catholicism and you understand what's going on, there were, there was an uh, argument as to which Catholics were going to take take over, whether they were Italian, Irish, or Pol eventually it became Polish as well. But there was a, this this uh, war going on between the between the Irish Catholics and the I Italian Catholics as to who who would have the most influence. As much fun as that sounds. You, you learn this when you study these stupid things. And who cares? Who really cares? Excuse me, you care so you understand. You only care if you're a part of that religion, right? Yeah, yeah but it, I mean, it changes the way, the way people react to other individuals. I used to live in Omaha. Omaha, Nebraska is 80% Catholic. But it's Irish Catholic, it's Italian Catholic, it's Polish Catholic, it's, what's another, Slovakian. There's... Czechs and Slovaks there, they hate each other. As much fun as that is. Anyway, okay, so you need to recognize that, uh, that your own culture may get in the way. So if you were counseling somebody from Phoenix and they were native, okay, but they're not Navajo, would you be able to do that? Would you try to convert them to your way of thinking? Can you do that? Maybe they're Hopi. Or Pima, or Apache. <clears throat> could you could you do that? Could you deal with that as a counselor? Okay. Well, you have to ask that. You guys have to ask yourselves that question. A counselor needs to recognize that their racial background uh, might influence the way that they see others, especially if those others are from another race. And of course, there are racial prejudices. Uh, if you live in Salt Lake, there's a lot of Mormons up there. God, it's the Mormon capital of the world. And it really is the Mormon capital of the world. Okay. Uh, so Mormonism has a lot of political influence. Okay. Well, they kicked all those kids out. That's fine. Okay. Uh, so while you're up there, they saw you as, as naked. I'm sure that's not the word they used. No, they kind of, it was more like um, an outsider, um, a person that needs to be pushed out. 
Okay. There was, there was three, three of us, but I would look more native than they did. One of them looked Asian and the other one looked Indian. Ah. Oh, so, from India. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, Asian Indian. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, they tried to, yeah, they, I got the one, the one end of the force, you know, they would be really mean to me. So it's not a lot of fun mm -hmm. being the outsider, is it? Yeah. They've got words for you. they got names for you. Yeah, they did, but they, they couldn't say it. Well, of course not. Yeah, but they I mean, almost yeah. Like swear. Right? Yeah. Well, you guys have a name for me, don't you? No. Yes, you do. <laughs> the hell you don't. <laughs> Wilson called me that the other day. What did he call you? Bill and Donna. That's the same. Wow, something worse. Yeah. It means that you're different. It means that you're an outsider. Right? I don't see it like that. Yeah. yeah. The, the it's a way of it, isolating me. It's not a... It's not a slur. It's like I don't think it's derogatory. It's derogatory. Sure it is. Yeah, it's not derogatory. It, but it, the word comes from the Tagani. Which means the people that won't die, because no matter how many we kill, they keep coming. <laughs> kill arms, they keep on. Subhuman, kind of like cockroaches. <laughs> okay, so it means cockroach. That's funny. <laughs> It'll die. It die. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody else ever uh, had had this kind of a reaction, where you were different? I used to live in Japan. In Japan, if you're not Japanese, you're gaijin, which means outsider. Oh, that's an, that's the nice interpretation. <laughs> it means, it means the guy that sneaks in the window at night. <laughs> what guy sneaks in the window at night? Oh yeah, a rapist. <laughs> <laughs> Never crawled through a window. Well, maybe I have. <laughs> Only so I could unlock the door. So. Okay. Has anybody else ever experienced being an outsider? At my own school, yeah. At your own school? Yeah. Like, I canned a little bit, but <laughs> but back then I didn't go outside, so I was like, really, am I too light complexed? I think I still am I? No, okay, answer me. Um, so I was really light complexed, so people thought I was a Navajo. Oh. Okay. So they thought, like, for like five years, everyone thought, like, oh, you're Navajo? And I'm like, yeah. We thought you were white or Mexican. Somebody said my dad was Mexican, and I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> they told me my own family's it racial background. But nobody said anything because they knew my dad was a cop and the and He'd jack him up. Yeah, so shoot him I, I didn't get it as bad as probably like other kids, so because they knew my dad was a cop. So it's okay if you're around the pe people that are like you, because then you don't have to worry about it, yeah. right? Sure. So let's all live near people that look like us and act like us. The last time that happened to me was the Republican convention I attended in Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> they let you in. <laughs> I used to be a Republican. <clears throat> Not anymore. No, no just the last well. couple times I went to things like that. Like my friend ran for sheriff of uh, Navajo County. He was a Republican candidate and I helped him campaign. Took him out to all the chapters and everything and introduced him to people. So. Uh, I think I've always been a Republican uh, since I started voting, but in the last couple, the last, especially the last election, there was it just you could feel when you're not welcomed when you sure. walk into a room. And I was in Phoenix at the, <clears throat> the convention down there. There was a lot of uh, you get a, pe people were saying things not directly to me, but loud enough for me to hear. Isn't that weird? And so I said, okay, I get you know I get it. I'm not welcomed here, and that's fine. I can take my vote elsewhere. Sure. Republicans, huh? Oh, interesting. <clears throat> when I was at Ashford, during the last election, I was at Ashford. Um, a lot of my students were Hispanic and, and African American. Uh, they decided they'd go to a Trump rally. Well, they didn't go for, for very long. They were kicked out. Not because they said anything, they were just standing there. But they were afraid they would say something because they were Hispanic and they were black. And because of that, they, they kicked them out of the, the auditorium. Uh, they had uh, security standing behind them, and then eventually they just decided that they weren't going to mess with them anymore, so they just ushered them out of the uh, auditorium, which seems odd. You, you would think that if you, that you could say anything that you wanted at, a, at an open 
forum like that. But it's not open. It's closed. So if you say something against the president at a Trump rally, they will they'll get they'll kick you out. That's the way it works. They kicked them out just for being different. They weren't white, so they kicked them out, as weird as that seems. <clears throat> and of course the military, everybody's the same. Green. Green. <laughs> Exactly. Everybody's the same color. <laughs> uh, Army, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine, Green. <clears throat> we all wear green clothes. Counseling needs to come to groups with their own ethnicity and uh, uh, how that influences who they are and how they see others. I don't have a clock, so you guys are going to have to tell me when I get close. Sorry. My, my, evidently my phone's dead. Okay. Uh, okay, so you need to come to grips with this. You need to know who you are. I've had people in counseling class at this institution who didn't think that they could handle people that weren't Navajo. They didn't want to. They only wanted to counsel other Navajos. But of course, not all Navajos are the same. They wear different clothes. Most of you wear black, strangely enough. You know? Especially in Chin Lee mm -hmm. at night. <laughs> uh, so is that like the same thing as like if I only wanted to work with veterans? Um, yeah, kind of. You should be able to counsel anybody. You should be able to deal with any situation. What you're going to just what you wanted, you probably want to work with veterans who are uh, who are combat veterans. Yeah. Who have PTSD. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but you're also, if you get into that type of counseling, you're also going to have to deal with females who have been sexually molested in, in the military. And there's a lot of them. Sexual trauma. Yeah. Sexual trauma. So you're going to have to deal with sexual trauma. You're going to have to deal with uh, individuals who... Or family members. They, they, yeah, you're going to have to deal with those people as well. But you're also going to have to deal with transgender people because there's... A larger number than we recognize at this point. A lot of people are changing their gender. They go into the military thinking that they are. Uh, what is this thing doing? This? They they go into the military military thinking uh, that that um, if they establish who they are by being more masculine, uh, that they will be able to uh, lose their female identity. But I mean, it happens all too often, well, very relatively, not that frequently, but it, it does happen that they, they realize, they recognize their feminine side, okay, yeah, a lot of transgenders. Uh, there's a lot of, um, oh, geez, that's not a, sexual orientation, of course, is not important in the military, but uh, there are uh, a relatively large number of, uh, of lesbians in the, in the military. You're going to have to deal with that as well. There's a general, one of the, there's an Air Force general that uh, uh, is, uh, has a wife. She has a wife. So, I mean, these things happen. And of course, there's nothing they can do about it anymore. In the old days, they could kick them out of service. But they, now they recognize all sexual orientations as, as equal or the same. <laughs> and it's not even up there anymore, is it? Well, they did a really good job putting this stuff together. <laughs> Self-understanding uh, is an essential step in understanding your clients. Uh, you need to recognize uh, some of the people that you can deal with and some of the, the people that you might have a difficult time dealing with. Uh, as I said, I have a difficult time dealing with women who have left their children. This really, it hurt me when she left. I didn't, I thought all women were good mothers, uh, because my mother's a good mother. Uh, my mother had uh, lots of kids because she liked to play with them. She liked kids. She liked being around kids. Other mothers, they have children because they think they're supposed to, and then they don't want to spend a lot of time with them because they get in the way. They smell bad. But my mother wasn't like that. She liked playing with kids. She, she did play with kids all of her life. She's a nurse. Uh, I know she played with her grandkids. She was in her 80s playing softball with her, with her grandkids. She loved it. She had a great time. Was her mother a good mother? Her mother? 
No, her mother was a shh, bad mother. <laughs> no, her mother uh, read a lot, and so she was raised by her older sister primarily. So her mother wasn't a very good mother. As a matter of fact, her brothers were. So they lived on a farm, and she did she did most of the farming with her dad because her brothers were lazy. Okay, I'm not going to use it. Okay, I'm not going to swear. But they were lazy. <laughs> And my, my mother, who's all of four foot eight. <laughs> and this was back in the day when they uh, they drove tractors that had no power steering. Uh, they uh, they uh, had horses that they had to yeah. control. Yeah, that's how they did things. And my tiny little mother was did that. Oh, God, she had arms the size of my legs. <laughs> you didn't want to wrestle with my mother. She went into nurses' training, and uh, one night they decided that they were going to have, they were going to see who could, who was the strongest. And my tiny little mother, who was they called Goody, her name was Goodwin, her last name was Goodwin. She kicked everybody's ass. <laughs> <laughs> All these great big women. She just laid them out. <clears throat> anyway, that was my mom. She liked kids. She liked to play with, you know. She liked to be, interact with with people. And some people people don't like to interact. Some people are really shitty parents. I'm way over here, so maybe you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> some grandparents don't want to play with their kids. I play with my grandson all the time. We play baseball. We play soccer. We play everything. We uh, the other day we had a water balloon fight. I won. <laughs> we had a water balloon fight. He goes down to Florida to interact with his dad and his dad's family. He plays video games the whole time because nobody wants to interact with him. They don't do that kind of thing. They're rich. Wealthy people, they play. They ain't fun at all. There are multiple influences on how we see ourselves and interpret the world around us. Uh, your culture, your race, and ethnicity are important. And of course, the first discussion question has to do with how you identify yourself. Do you identify yourself as, as, as Navajo? Do you how do you identify yourself? That's the question. And it's really quite important that you need to know who you are. Your gender and sexual orientation are, are influential. Uh, your socioeconomic status, your spirituality and religion, your life stage, your family of origin, your disability or, or ability uh, are influential, whether you can do things or whether you can't do things. Uh, my wife, as I told you, she had uh, hip surgery. She had both of her hips replaced last year. I'm very athletic. <clears throat> I do things. I'll probably, I may go lift this afternoon. I hope so. I hope I can find time to go lift this afternoon. I do things all the time. I do athletic things. I walk, I ran the dogs yesterday. And I'm dragging these two damn dogs. <laughs> I'm running along and they, they, they can't keep up with me. <laughs> I, I think they're lazy. <laughs> More than anything else, and I'm bragging these two damn dogs. You know, I'm running past a a, 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 a shadow, and they lay down to, to sleep. You know, both of my dogs. As ridiculous as that is. My point is that uh, our abilities or our disabilities influence who we are. <clears throat> my wife is starting to gain a little bit of weight because she can't move. She had both of her hips replaced. She got a bad knee. She got a bad shoulder. She was in a Bradley accident once upon a long time ago, and it really screwed up her joints because she hit like it rolled over. So it rolled over on its side, then rolled over on its top, then rolled over on its other side, and ended up on back on its back in the right place. But they hit four times, and when she hit, she hit her shoulder, she hit her neck, she hit her hips. Uh, she caught herself with her wrists, and now she has carpal tunnel. Uh, so now she's, she has disabilities because of her accident, because she was in a Bradley vehicle accident over in Korea. Anyway, that has to do with disability and ability. <clears throat> and I think the reason that she hates me <laughs> is because I can do things and she can't do anything. Uh, she's decided she wants to kayak. Oh, let's look at this. She wants to kayak. Which is okay, but she can't lift the kayak out of the truck to put it in the water. 
I know. Level of stress demands uh, in our life is important as well. How much stress are you under? Uh, this is just a hint and a warning, and I think I sent you guys an email uh, where I'm whining about how many students I have. Okay. But the reality is I've got over 160 students this semester. I've got Scott three times. <laughs> Which is good. Because <laughs> Scott and I are pals. But uh, I've got 160 students, so if you could get your work done, uh, and on time or whatever. I, I don't really care when you turn things in. I, I'm not going to count off if you're late. I don't take off for late work. But if you could do that, that would be, that would be great. Because the problem is I've got individuals that are procrastinators. I'm not looking at anybody specifically. <laughs> but I do have students, there we go. I do, I do have students who are, who are procrastinators. And if I have 160 students that are procrastinators, Come December, come Christmas, I'm going to be grading everybody's paper. And that's 160 papers that I have to grade. Three, three of Scott. So, <laughs> I hope you can read it. <laughs> Let Corey read them and make sure that they're okay. No, no, oh, no, you, you, can, you, you can read hers and make sure hers are okay. <laughs> no, I've read Corey's papers. They're, they're pretty good. I don't think I've ever had a paper from Scott. So stress is, <laughs> is huge as far as, uh, as, as you are concerned and as far as they are concerned. Uh, one of the problems in this field is burnout. Uh, people burn out after a, a number of years. Um, one of the things that you have to do, and you have to do this in emergency rooms, you have to be resilient. You have to be able to get, uh, to not let things get to you. <clears throat> one night uh, we had a... Uh, we had a baby that came in. The baby had, uh, the parents had put the baby to sleep on a waterbed. This is back when they actually had waterbeds. Uh, the baby had rolled over, and uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. nobody checked on the baby enough. This is that whole shitty parent thing. Um, they didn't check on the baby enough, and the baby asphyxiated. Uh, because it couldn't push itself up from the waterbed. When it pushed down, the waterbed came up. Anyway, the baby is asphyxiated. And that's hard to deal with. Of course, I was a lab tech at the time. I was in the emergency room. Uh, I was, I was the, working in the morgue that night. I know. It's tough, it's tough stuff. But you can't let it get to you because the next guy that came in cut his hand off. <clears throat> so we had to deal with that. You've got a baby that's brain dead, and you've got a guy with, a, with his hand cut off, and the next person that came in was in an automobile accident. You can't let it get to you. You have to be able to develop coping skills. have to cope one way or the other. <clears throat> yeah. And of course, some people cope by drinking, other people cope by forgetting about it. I cope by forgetting about it. It's just the way it works. Well, I'd still remember the baby died. And one of the one of the, one, I know it's, it's a tragedy, okay? But we were able to transplant, we saved seven babies' lives with that one, the death of that one baby. I know, I know, I know. So there are positives to every negative. Okay. This is in Omaha. I know. We were the hospital that, that held all the dead bodies. We held the bodies until we could transplant them. That was our job. Multicultural competence is a significant predictor of a satis uh, satisfaction in counseling. Uh, but you have to be multicultural. You have to be able to deal with all of this stuff. You have to be able to deal with other cultures. If there's anybody that you can't stand, and it's a group of people, then you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong field. If you can't stand people from farming, you can't stand people from Gallup, or people from Phoenix, or city people, or country people, or, or black people, or white people. I know it's hard, white people are really hard to tolerate. Uh, they think they're superior to everybody else. If you can't handle those people, then you're in the wrong game. This is get into something else, where you can talk about Belagana all day long. <laughs> Bastards. <laughs> I think that's what Bill got really needs. <laughs> <laughs> Difficulties may arise from unacknowledged differences in perception. Uh, you're going to see things differently. 
Um, that's one of the things I learned when I first came here. I had been up on the Fort Belknap Reservation for 10 years. I thought I understood Indians, as if all Indians were the same. But of course, I had come in contact with the Sioux, I'd come in contact with the Nez Perce. One of my best friends was a Nez Perce uh, up there. Uh, and they don't think the same. And they have swear words for each other. That's fun. <laughs> Nobody likes the crow. I don't know what that's all about. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what they call them up to. But, I mean, if you come in contact with a crow, they, they look and act just like everybody else. So, I mean, it's not like, it's the idea of the crow, I guess. Anyway, so you need to uh, understand that they see things differently than you do. They're, they're Northern Plains Indians. You guys are Southern, Southwestern Indians. Your way of looking at the world is completely different than theirs. <clears throat> they were buffalo hunters. You guys did hunt buffalo to some extent, but not like they did. I mean, that's all they did. That's that's what they. That's how they survived is buffalo hunting. So they're tall, so that they can shoot down on the buffalo. And if you ask them, what, what do they do? We were buffalo hunters, and they always shoot an arrow. <laughs> <laughs> like buffalo or little rabbits running. Because the they were on the horse. <laughs> exactly. And they always shoot down. They're funny. <laughs> a little bit happier than you guys are. Happy people. Everything's a joke. They laugh all the time. Everything. I don't know. Chuckleheads. <laughs> always smiling. It is critical to examine beliefs, assumptions, and biases. You have them. They have them. But we need to deal with these. Uh, if you can't stand the, somebody, the F-bomb, if you can't stand somebody using the F-word, uh, I was walking back to my office the other day, and this other faculty member came up, and it was fucking this and fucking that. Oh, my God. I didn't believe that somebody was swearing like that, and he was a faculty member. <clears throat> now, normally I don't swear. I don't swear. Well. <clears throat> Except with my wife. <laughs> when we're talking about the military, usually. Uh, but uh, I, I usually don't use that word. And this guy, every third word. I mean, it's like he just got out of the service. And had been under fire. <laughs> it was bad. I mean, it was really pretty bad. And Jeremiah was standing right beside me. And I thought Jeremiah was going to drop his teeth. You know, it was... <laughs> Who talks like that? But if you can't handle that, then you shouldn't be in this game. You've got to let them do that. Because they're, that's how they dissipate their emotions. That's how they... Uh, that makes them feel better. It, it releases tension. And if they have to hold that in, now we got a problem. Now we got worse of a problem. But if you can let them just expound, and of course, working with military veterans, you're going to see that and hear that a lot. And this is one of the reasons, you know, I come back from, I come back from uh, summer vacation, and, you know, I've been around military guys, and wow. I'm lucky I can control my, my vocabulary. Because they, they, that's one of their favorite words. Everything is able to have sexual intercourse and so on. Isn't that what it means? <laughs> A pencil? Come on. Your car? Really? <laughs> Something broke and it was having sexual intercourse at the time, I guess. You don't know what happened. You're lucky. It, it is, a verb. It's, it's a verb. Exactly. It is equally important to understand culture's influence on the on the client as far as as well as your your uh, culture as well. Uh, I've got two military guys in here, and it may get really raw uh, because uh, that's just what happens <laughs> when military people get together. We read about other races. So how do you learn about other cultures? Well, you read about it. Uh, this is one of the things I'm doing in cultural psychology. If anybody's in my cultural psychology class, uh, you're going to have to read a book about another culture. And you're going to have to identify your culture by comparing it with that culture. Whatever that culture may happen to be. It can be Korea, it can be Japan, it can be, it can be any place. It can be another tribe. What kind of book make it? Fiction, non fiction. Oh, fiction, non fiction doesn't work. Just finished one. Yeah. What, what did you, what is it? I read Veil of Roses. It's about a, a 
a female um, lady. She's 27, and she came to the United States from Iran, and she oh, has she's to get Iranian. married. Oh. Yeah, she has to get married within three months or she has to go back to Iran, sure. and her parents had um, got Arranged her a visa. Visa. Yeah. So it's just like, it's, it's really interesting, and I, I, I read that whole thing. So. Oh, cool. There you go, so you're, you're already done. So you can read about other races, you can read about other cultures, you can read about other <coughs> ethnicities. I have a bunch of, tons of books in my office uh, dealing with other cultures other than this culture. Uh, during the summer, I thought I'd I was, I was trying to help myself. I read uh, Navajo Wars, which is about this area and this, this group, uh, and Blood and Thunder about uh, Kit Carson, and the real story of Kit Carson, and the real story about the, the Long Walk, which is kind of interesting. Because he was in charge of that, the Long Walk. It's really kind of fascinating. So the history I hear here isn't exactly the same as, as that history. We recognize the strengths and weaknesses in dom of dominant and minority racial groups, and of course you need to do that. Oh, there he is, Superman. All right. Strengths and weaknesses. <clears throat> By developing mean meaningful relationships with people from various racial and cultural groups, we can gain a different perspective on all people. And this is one of the problems that I see with religion. Religion, uh, they, don't, they don't want to talk, Presbyterians don't want to talk to Methodists. Methodists don't want to talk to Lutherans. Lutherans don't want to talk to Catholics. Catholics don't want to talk to Mormons. Mormons don't want to talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, and Jehovah's Witnesses don't want to talk to anybody. Okay. My point is, if you are in a select religious group, you don't really interact with, with people outside your religious group. <clears throat> or you don't have to. Unless you're non-denominational. <laughs> Unless you're not, it's a non-denominational institution or, or whatever, which there aren't that many of those around. Anyway, so we need to develop uh, meaningful relationships with other individuals. Whether they're white or black or Hispanic, uh, big question about immigration right now. <coughs> uh, huge question about immigration right now. We don't know what Trump's going to do next. Uh, looks like he's going to shut down immigration completely. At least that's what he's threatening to do. Uh, lots of strange things are going on. Uh, and who are these people trying to come into the United States? What's the hell's wrong with these people? Why are they trying to come into the United States? Who are they? Where are they from? Iran, of course. They're all from Iran. Where are they? Coming across the border. Who are they? Are they Mexicans coming across the Mexico border with Mexico? They're all Mexican? Is that what's going on? Who are these people? Who are these people we're keeping out? Do we have any clue? Do we know what they're like? Do we know what language they speak? Wait, just wait. Have I got a story for you? How am I doing on time? Please. We have six minutes. Six minutes? Yes. Okay, I, I can finish this. Thing. Who's coming across the border? Any ideas? We keep he talking about caravans. And Massive immigrants. Mexicans. Who are they? Mexicans. Mexicans? Yeah. Most of them aren't. I know. Wait a minute, that's a Mexican border. It should be Mexicans coming across a Mexican border, shouldn't it? Didn't they say, um... Gosh. Wasn't it El Salvadorian? El Salvadorian, Honduran, uh, Guatemala. Yeah, they've got lots of problems down there. And people are fleeing because the gangs... Uh, Kind of control things down there and it's very dangerous to be young it's dangerous to be female uh, in that area because of what's going on so they flee and they're coming to the united states because it's safer here than it is in guatemala honduras and El Salvador or whatever. <clears throat> so most of them aren't actually mexican at all they're they do speak spanish some of them speak another language as curious as that is and we'll talk about that in just a second Okay, I got five minutes, right? Okay. <laughs> so we need to talk to people with a different perspective. So if we want to know about the immigrants, we need to talk to the immigrants. We need to find out who these people are. Don't we? Or just keep everybody out. Now, it was up to you guys. You would have kept me out, right? 400 years ago when my people came across. Okay. <laughs> 
It's too late. I'm already here. We've been here for three or four hundred years. I'm sorry, it's too late. You can call me all the names you want. <laughs> I know what that word means. I met Jan Brewer once when she was the governor. Uh -huh. and she asked me what, what my thoughts were uh, on immigration because she was uh, the same thing. She was really strong on border control. Ah. And I said, I agreed with her. <clears throat> I, said, I said, why don't we just start? I think the date from 14, anybody who arrived after 1492, go back. <laughs> Did you think that was funny? <laughs> Did she laugh? No? No. That would have kicked her people out too. My commander didn't think it was funny. Because <laughs> she was the governor at the time. She was touring the National Guard units. A lot of us were working on border patrol missions. Yeah. So we were getting ready to go down and she asked us what we thought about it. That's what I told her. <laughs> By developing relationships with colleagues and mentors who are willing to discuss cultural and racial issues, some people don't want to talk about it, and a lot of people don't want to talk about it. It's too inflammatory. So we don't want to talk about it. Maybe we don't, we don't want to talk about it. Maybe there are people in here that, that believe that uh, there shouldn't be anybody coming across the border. Lock the damn thing down. Keep everybody out. By God, my people are here, so that's, and we came here two generations ago. That's, don't let anybody who hasn't been here for more than two generations. How about that? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how you guys feel about this stuff. I mean, as far as you're concerned, we're all, uh, all non Navajos are, are immigrants. But did you guys start here? What's that? Did you start right here? No. So you guys were someplace else too? Yeah. Okay. If we pretend that the land bridge never, was never there, and that you have always been here, been in, in the Americas, you still didn't start here. Weren't you farther north? Well, our cultural stories it starts with the black, blue, yellow, and white. There's right. the and so we, our, our own cultural history is a story of migration. Right. <clears throat> right. So we can assume that you didn't start in Arizona. Yeah. Okay. And New Mexico. Don Danettdale did a research, and he said we're from the the, the, the story of the Navajos. Don Danettdale did a research, and he said that we might have came from the Mongolians. Okay. And then we came from Alaska. There you go. Yeah. There's a, uh, all the all the Indians in Alaska are Athabasca. Speak Athabasca. But the only thing is, though, the mitochondrial DNA <clears throat> between Native Americans and Asians are different. Yeah. And also our teeth, um, different nationalities, different racial groups have different, there's a shovel, there's different forms. Right. Ours is different from Asians as well, too, right. so we're distinctly different people. And you have hook roots. My son has hook roots. So and is, is he American Indian? <clears throat> My son? My wife claimed that she was Chickasaw. There's three basic groups of Native Americans. The first one were the uh, Paleo Indians and the Anasazis, and then there was a second migration. Then the third migration, the last one was Athabascans, which the Diné or Navajo are part of. The land. So, so the, the last, Indian, the last, the last migration. Yeah, even with the Native Americans, there's three different, distinct different groups. Yeah. Wow, that's impressive that you recognize that. Thank you. Because not a lot of people don't. The Choctaw think that they came out of the mud, which is kind of interesting. That's a Choctaw. So we can watch films about other races. Is it time? Am I doing okay? Do I have any more? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. I got. I got to talk about language. Talk fast. For just a second. I know. <laughs> Participating in cultural activities or visiting other countries, and some of us have been to other countries, and we know that, that they ain't the same as we are. Uh, if you, if you uh, watch movies about the Japanese or you look at movies, they're almost like Americans, aren't, aren't they? Mm -hmm. The hell they are. If you've ever lived in Japan, well, for one thing, I was a gaijin over there. But <laughs> they, they, they're not, they, they don't act that way. And of course, they, it's not in the movies, but they're, the, the fact that they're so, much, so very much different than we are. Uh, so visiting other countries is important. I, let me tell you the story about uh, language real quick before we leave. Um, there, there, there were groups coming across uh, the, uh, the border, and uh, they were interviewing them, and they interviewed them in Spanish. 
Now the problem was that these guys, even though they were from El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, they didn't speak Spanish, even though that's the language of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. They were indigenous. They were, and they spoke a Mayan dialect, and that's all they spoke. But they thought they were communicating with them, despite the fact they weren't. And so they agreed to, one of the little girls that died in, in custody, uh, she died of some respiratory illness. And her father, they said, well, her father agreed. Well, her father couldn't speak Spanish, and they were speaking to him in Spanish. And so he signed whatever they told him to sign. But he couldn't speak Spanish. He, was, he spoke an indigenous language. And there are people down there who are indigenous, but they don't, they don't recognize them by the name of the tribe. The United States does. We talk about you guys being Diné, we talk about the Apache, we talk about Comanche, we talk about all of these different tribes. But down, down in the south, they don't, they don't recognize that stuff. They don't recognize the tribe. They don't, they've lost their identity. The people in southern Mexico, the Chi in the Chiapas region, they've lost their identity because the Spanish didn't recognize that. Anyway, that's not important. Okay, I'll see you guys next time. It's about that. I'll see you guys next time. Work out your biography. Think about what you want, what problem you want to have, how you want to act, what kind of a problem you've got. If you want to be... You know who did that? Yeah. Ha, 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 ha.